I know that it is my responsibility when I stand before you to proclaim the word of the Lord to you and that alone. And so it's important to me for you to be able to see as we go through it that everything I tell you is exactly what God would say to you from His Word this morning. Nothing added to it, nothing taken away. This is the Word from the Lord, and then it is your responsibility to respond to it in a manner that is appropriate. So this morning, that is what I want to be able to do, and I want you to be able to see it. So please, if you have your Bible, keep it open to Ezra 1. Or if you charged your Bible last night, maybe you can keep it on. Whatever the case may be. If you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer before I go any further. Father, I I come to you right now, and I just want to ask, Lord, that you would do what you do. Father, this is your word. Father, I have no power and authority in and of myself to accomplish anything with it. Father, unless you use me, unless you speak through me this morning, you're, then your word will not be proclaimed in a way that can actually accomplish what it is meant to accomplish. And so, Father, I humbly recognize that before you this morning, before all of these people. Father, I ask you to just simply do what you do. Father, speak to our hearts. Father, Tell us what it is that you want us to hear from you this morning. And Father, it's my prayer that you would have mercy on us and that you would give us your grace through your word and that, Father, none of us would leave here the same when we walk out of here today. Father, I pray, God, that we would hear from you and that we would forever be changed. Father, we love you and we praise you and I ask you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to remind you that what we're looking at here in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah We're looking at the narrative of God returning His children Israel from Babylonian captivity back to the promised land. A promised land that they're coming back to that is completely destroyed, burned to the ground. There is absolutely nothing left. And God is now calling them to go back to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the covenant with Israel between the people and, the God, and God, and to rebuild the walls and the city. And so God is in a rebuilding phase. And this is exactly what He promised that He was going to do. He promised He was going to do it through the prophet Isaiah, uh, or in the prophet Isaiah. He promised He was going to do it through King Cyrus of Persia. And so this, this is not something that the Jews did not know was coming. Or let me say this, they should have known this was coming, but many of them missed it up until this point, as most of us do. God tells us many things in His Word, but how many of you know we usually miss it? Um, and so that we're no different than, than they are here in this context. Whenever I say that, I don't mean to be demeaning toward them. We would have done exactly what they have done. I'm just being honest with you. But what we have here in Ezra chapter 1 is the introduction of God actually bringing His people back into the land of Israel. Now, what I want you to be able to notice is that one of the purposes of this book is laid out here in verse 1. So, this this is important that you understand. If you really want to get the most out of the Word of God, then you don't come to the Word of God just trying to look into it to say, well, what do I get out of it? Instead, you always come to the Word of God and you try to find out from God what was your purpose for writing this book. When you you wrote these words and when you put this in the Bible that we have today, what was your purpose for giving us the book of Ezra? And one of the purposes is laid out very plainly. Look at verse 1 with me if you would. In the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, And notice what this next phrase says. That the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. That's important. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom, and he also put it in writing, and then he gives the proclamation next. But here's the point. One of the main purposes of this book as we study through it is that God wants you to know this morning 
And this is evidence that will help you know that this is true. What am I talking about? Namely, God's Word never fails. Whatever God speaks, it will come to pass. And He will cause it to come to pass. And you're going to be able to see that as we go through this text this morning. But I want you to understand that when I come to you this morning and preach to you, my goal is not to just try to make you feel better this morning. My goal is not just to encourage you and build you up so that you walk out of here ready to take on the gates of hell with a water pistol. That's, that's not my goal this morning. My goal this morning is for you to walk away saying, I just heard the word of the Lord. And I can either believe it and apply it to my life, or I can not believe it and go on being the exact same way as I was before I heard it. The choice is yours. But one thing is certain, the Word of God will not fail. He will cause His Word to be fulfilled. He will accomplish everything that He has said. And I don't know about you, but that's important to me to know this morning. That's important to me to know that He has promised me that in my darkest hours, when I go through the fire and when I walk through the flood, where's He going to be? He's going to be right there with me. He has promised me that according to His Word, He will never leave me and He will never forsake me. Can I trust His Word this morning? Amen. Yes, I can. He has promised me that though my sins be as red as scarlet, that He will wash them away and make me as white as wool. Amen. Can I believe Him this morning? Yes, I can, because His Word will never fail. And so this is a very important concept. The Bible tells us in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says that God cannot lie. Look what he says here. Paul is writing to, Timothy, or to Titus in the hope of eternal life. He says, Titus, when I'm writing to you, I'm writing to you in the hope of eternal life, which God, who what? Never lies. God cannot lie, and He promised us this before the ages began. How does Paul know that God never lies? Well, first off, he's experienced it in his own life. But second off, because he has seen the evidence of it from the stories of old, that everything God has ever said, God accomplished, and He caused it to come to pass. And so, I want you to notice that Whenever you read through these books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you're going to see things like, for instance, in verse 1, that the way the Lord accomplished His Word is by stirring up. Notice what he says at the end of verse 1. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. Now this word spurred means to awaken or to arouse. In other words, this honestly was not necessarily Cyrus' own doing. This was something that God caused to take place. God had proclaimed a word, God had made a promise, and God is going to fulfill that promise. Ain't you glad this morning that your salvation from start to finish is in the hands of God? Because if it was up to me, do you think I would have ever chose for God to save me? No, I didn't even want God. I wanted myself. I wanted my own desires. I wanted to live my life. I'm okay with God as long as God lines up with everything that I want to do. But thank God this morning that He opened my eyes to show me my rebellion against Him and He saved my soul. Thank God this morning that I found myself in the corner of a room one night at midnight crying my eyes out, God, if you can just forgive me of my sins. Lord, I'll praise you forever. And I thank God that He saved me that night. And I thank God that since that day, do you think I have done everything right to keep my salvation if it was up to me? Everybody do this right here. Long ways from it. But do you want to know why I'm still saved today? Because God has promised me something, and when God promised it, He's going to cause it to be completed. This is the reason why the Apostle Paul could come to the Philippians, I believe it was, and say, I am confident that the work that He began in you, He will bring it to completion. 
That's the reason why Paul could say that. Why? Because God cannot lie and because God made a promise. And if God called you out of your sin and He put you on the path to salvation, God is also going to cause you to persevere to the end and He will save you. And I'm thankful for that this morning. I want you to um, notice again that in verse 1, all of this that we're fixing to read happened to, quote, fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. So one of the things you see right there is that God spoke a word through Jeremiah. And somewhere along the way, God has already determined that when this time comes, in God's time, I am going to cause all the pieces to come into play so that the word that I promised is going to be accomplished. Let me show you one of those words this morning in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10 through 14. Look at what this says. For thus says the Lord. Now this is what Jeremiah prophesied when they were fixing to go into Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah promised them this from the Lord. Thus says the Lord. That's my job this morning too. Jeremiah didn't come and tell them, here's what I think God's going to do. No, Jeremiah came and he said, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. That's a promise. I'm going to visit you. When 70 years are completed in Babylon. And I will fulfill to you my promise and I will bring you back to this place. Now go to verse 11. Why is God going to do this? Because God says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Now listen, there are so many people that misinterpret that scripture. Or let me say this. They misapply that scripture. God does have a wonderful plan for your life. Does that mean that His plan is that everything is going to be perfect and that He's going to fix everything and He's going to make everything go your way? No. When did He tell them what is God's plan? God said, I know the plans. Do you know where they're fixing to go for 70 years? Their entire world is fixing to be destroyed and they are fixing to go into captivity for the next 70 years. And God says to them, I know the plans that I have for you. We like to take this scripture today and go, man, God's got a wonderful plan for my life and I know that He's going to bless me with this job and bless me with this and He's going to do this for me and my kids are always going to be healthy and happy and, and free and... Did God ever promise you that anywhere in His Word? No, He didn't. God promised you that He does have a wonderful plan for you. But because you're a sinner, that plan is going to take you through some rough, rough spots to mold you into what He is going to make you become. And so, Jeremiah promised but, uh, from the Word of the Lord that I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now go with me to verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and then I will hear you. You will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. What does it take in our lives for, us to, uh, for God to actually make us seek Him with all our hearts? The truth of the matter is most of the time your prayer life don't even begin until you hit the bottom. You realize I've got nowhere else to turn. You realize I've got no control over anything. I can't fix anything. And so where do I turn? To the only one that can. And he says, you will seek me according to my plan that I have for you. <laughs> you're going to seek me and you're going to find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And then finally verse 14. I will be found by you. That's a promise, right? I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This was the promise that God had made His people before they went into captivity to the mouth of Jeremiah. So what is Ezra about? Ezra is so that you know that when God makes a promise, 
You can bank on it. Listen, these guys, most of them had already set up their life in the kingdom of Babylon. In this, now the Babylon is fixed to be taken over by the Persian Empire, absorbed, if you will, by it. And so we have them, they have set up their entire lives. God actually told them in Jeremiah chapter 25, He actually told them, build houses in this place. Marry in this place. Have children in this place. Pray for the welfare of this place because in the welfare of this place is where you're going to find your welfare. And so they had set up lives and they had set up families in this place. And now God comes back to them and He says, I'm going to bring you back. And they've done got pretty comfortable where they are. How many of you know that many of us in our lives, whenever God tells us, hey, I know the plans I've got for you. And I know the eternal hope that I have for you, the eternal life in heaven that I have for you. And how many times do we sit back and we're pretty comfortable right where we are? We don't even realize we're slaves. We don't even realize that this place is cursed. We, we become pretty okay with this place. And God said, if you only knew, if you only knew the plans that I actually have for you, if you only knew what I have prepared for you, if you only knew the fortunes that I'm going to restore to you, if you only knew how I'm going to gather you and give you the kingdom that I am king over where there is no hunger, there is no sickness, there is no pain, there is no death, if you really only knew, there'd be no way you'd be content and comfortable in the place where you are. So what does God have to do? God has to stir up some hearts. God has to stir our heart up to be able to show us that this is not where our hope lies. Now, I want to show you a few scriptures here, give you a little context. Daniel, y'all have heard of the prophet Daniel, right? Daniel was an exile in Babylon during this time. Daniel was just a child when they carried him away. Daniel's parents were probably killed and then him and other children were carried away and they were made slaves in the king's court. And you can read all about that in Daniel chapter 1. But in this exile in Babylon, Daniel so prospered that he became one of the king's counselors, if you will. Probably one of the top counselors whenever you read Daniel. And we believe that probably what happened is that Daniel was, we know, was reading these words from Jeremiah because look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 through 2. In the first year of Darius, and this was the king before Cyrus, all right? In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the prophet to Jeremiah must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely what? Seventy years. Now think about what is being said here. Daniel is in slavery in in Babylonian captivity. And he starts reading Jeremiah. Now years of down the road, And Daniel is an older man at this point. And he reads it and he says, Oh my goodness, it's almost been 70 years. What does that mean? The time is near. And so he says, I read the prophet where Jeremiah said 70 years is going to pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem. And now go with me to Daniel chapter 10 verse 1. In the third year of who? Cyrus king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel whose name was Belshazzar, and the word was true. It was a great conflict and he understood the word and he had understanding of the vision. Here's the point I'm making with these scriptures. Daniel was a very high official. He was the one the kings always came to interpret dreams, to get wisdom, to get counsel. Daniel was the man. Daniel is likely the one that took these words back to Cyrus and showed Cyrus this is what God promised His people. Now what's also amazing about this is 150 years before Cyrus is born, Isaiah actually prophesied about this and called Cyrus by name before the man is even born. Let me show you some scriptures to back that up. Isaiah 44 verse 28. 
God says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, She shall be built, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. Did y'all catch that? A hundred and fifty years before this ever happened, and Daniel likely took Isaiah and Jeremiah and went back to Cyrus because we know that how does the Lord stir our hearts? With the Word of God. What does the Bible say? Faith comes by what? And hearing what? More than likely what happened is Daniel took Isaiah and Daniel took Jeremiah and Daniel took these scriptures back to Cyrus and he says, Cyrus, there's something I need to show you. And then he reads Isaiah 45 verse 1. He says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loosen the belts of kings to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. So let me ask you a question. Who gave Cyrus the kingdom that Cyrus has? Who allowed this evil to come in and take over and destroy Jerusalem? God did. And He promises through Isaiah, I will go before you, Cyrus, and I will level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze. I will cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. In other words, why is God calling Cyrus to do all this? For whose sake? For the sake of Israel. For the sake of the salvation of His people. He's not going to let His people be, uh, their faith go destroyed. And so He says, For the sake of my servant Jacob and of Israel my chosen, I call you by name. I name you, and notice this last part, though what? You don't know me. God is going to stir up somebody that doesn't even know Him. God will use people in this world that have no clue who He is for your salvation. To mold you, to make you, and to, to, to turn you into everything that He has called you to be. And then finally, one last verse, Isaiah 45 verse um, 13. Go to that one. 45 verse 13 if I gave it to you. I have stirred him up, talking about Cyrus, in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city. This is 150 years before Cyrus is born. He shall build my city. He shall set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. These are all the things that Cyrus is going to do because the Lord is going to stir him up to accomplish these things for the salvation of His people. So let me say to you again, what, are the, what is one of the primary purposes of why God gives us the books of Ezra and Nehemiah? <coughs> Excuse me. He gives us these books to prove to us that when God makes a promise, I don't care how many years ago it was, I don't care what I said, how long ago it was, if I make a promise... I will cause it to come to pass. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are for you this morning to read and look at and your faith to be strengthened and your mind to be reminded that yes, God has made me promises the same way that He made them promises. He kept those promises and guess what He's going to do to the promises that He made to you? He's going to keep them. He is going to cause His Word to be fulfilled. Now, <clears throat> I have to ask this question. Why is believing God's Word so important to Him? Because remember, this is how you're saved. The Bible says you're saved by faith and faith alone. God says that He makes you a promise. For those that put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ... He will wash your sins away. He will forgive you and He will cleanse you of all of your unrighteousness and He will make you His and He will save you. That's His promise, right? And so we have this promise this morning 
Why is it so important to God that we believe that in order to be saved? Because that's what the Bible said about Abraham. That Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. So why is that? Well, let me explain something to you. God is truth. He is the very definition of truth. God is perfect in every way. God is righteous. God is just. There is no failure or flaw in Him whatsoever. Therefore, His Word is an example of who He is. Now think about the way that we fell into sin to begin with. God told Adam and Eve, you can eat, this is His Word, you can eat from any tree and from everything that I've given you, you may eat freely. But of this one tree, you shall never eat of it, because in the day that you eat of this tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall die. That's His Word, right? That's His promise. What happened when Satan came to Eve? How did he tempt Eve into sin? He said to her, Did God really say that if you eat from this, you'll die? God did not really say that. You shall not surely die. In other words, Satan comes and he says, you can't trust God. God is a liar and you can't trust Him. And you want to know what happened? Eve believed it. And in effect, what Eve did is she called God a liar. And when you call the perfect, truthful, just, righteous, loving, merciful, graceful, no flaw in any way, when you call Him a liar, you have just committed the worst sin that there is because you have threw mud on His character. We were created not to throw mud on His character, We were created to worship His character. And the way we should have worshipped His character is whenever Satan came to Eve and said, Did God really say that you're going to die? That's exactly what He said, and that's exactly what will happen. How do I know that? Because I know who He is. The reason why you and I are saved by faith today is because when we hear the Word of God and we believe Him, what we say is, In our hearts, he says, God, we we know who you are. We know the kind of God that you are. And we know that there is no error in you whatsoever. And because of that, I believe you. And God says when we do that, he accredits it to us for righteousness. And what does that mean? Let's say you have a bank account. If I give you a credit of $100 in that bank account, what did I do? I put $100 in that bank account, right? God has righteousness. And God says when we believe Him, that He takes that righteousness and He puts that into your account. And so you are saved by believing that when God makes a promise, He will do it. And here's the thing about it. Faith is not the same thing as believing. We'll get to that here in just a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. Go back to me to Ezra chapter 1. I want to go through this and, um, and show you just a few things of what we're talking about here. Ezra chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. I want to show you the first part of the outline. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it into writing. And the proclamation, as you'll read, is that he's going to send the Israel, the exiles of Israel back to their homeland and he commands them to build a temple to their God. And so the first thing I want you to notice is that God inspires men to proclaim His Word. He always has. Now think about what He said right here. That His Word by the mouth of who? Jeremiah might be fulfilled. 
God has always used men to come and proclaim His Word to His people. And so it's important that you understand this morning that whenever God spoke to people, He always spoke to them. Yes, there were times that He would speak to prophets through dreams and through visions, but He always spoke to men. To Moses, the Bible actually says, he spoke mouth to mouth, word to word, if you will. And so what we have here is another example of showing us that God speaks to His people through prophets. Let me show you in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7 through 9. Look at what this scripture says. O Lord, You have deceived me, and I was deceived. That sounds like a good way for a sermon to start off, right? You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. And look at verse 8. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision. Now think about what he's saying right here. Jeremiah has been preaching the word of God. And how many of you don't want to know that, or how many of you know that when the Word of God is taught, a lot of times it's not a word that we want to hear. Most time it's a word that's telling us to repent. Most time it's a word that's showing us that we're not right with Him. And Jeremiah has been out preaching the Word of God, and he has been laughed at because remember what I said about us and the Word of God? We look at God and we say, we hear it, but we don't believe it. Same way Eve did, the same way Adam did, the same way they did with Noah. You remember when Noah preached? God told Noah, I'm going to send a flood on this earth and everybody that's in the ark, I'm going to save. And what did Noah do for the next 120 years? He built an ark, but what else did he do? He preached the Word. He preached it. And do you know what all of the people of the world other than his family did with his words? They laughed at it. They laughed at it. Well, that's no different. Same way with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. God promised, I'm going to destroy this city, but He told Lot, listen, if you'll get up out of this place, I'm going to save you and your family. And then Lot goes and he tells his son-in-laws and he tells people around him. And the Bible says his son-in-laws laughed at him. You know why? Because that's what we do to the Word of God. We laugh at the Word of God. God has always spoken through prophets and through men. And God has always sent His words of warning and His words of promise. God never just sent warning. He always sent words of promise to go along with it. But people always laughed. And Jeremiah said, I had decided that because I was getting laughed at, I'd become a reproach. I had become a derision all day long. And I ain't seen no destruction. Jeremiah had almost got to a place of such discouragement that he literally says to God out of his discouragement, you deceived me. Now you know that's not true. But look what he says next in verse 9. If I say, I will not mention him. <laughs> if you ever become a preacher, there will come a point in your life that you'll say, man, I don't want to do this anymore. I know you wouldn't think that. You would think that a preacher would always want to be a preacher, wouldn't you? And for the most part, you're right, because there is. There's something inside of you you can't deny, you can't get away from it. But there do come moments in your life to where you say, you know what, I don't even want to mention his name. I don't want to speak anymore in his name. But he said, if I did that, look what happened. If I did that, there is in my heart as if it were a what? A burning fire shut up in my bones. And I am weary with holding it in. I can't not tell you, thus says the Lord. I don't care if you laugh at me. I don't care if you mock me. I don't care if you deride me. I don't care what you do. The fact of the matter is, God has a word for you. And I have a responsibility to speak it to you. And the more I try not to, the more it's like a fire burning up in my bones so that I am weary of holding it in and I cannot. Let me show you another scripture if you would. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 through 2. Because in the Old Testament, God always spoke through prophets and God always spoke through people. And God still does today, but it's a little different. Let me show you what He says. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, what did God do? God spoke 
to our fathers by the prophets. That's the way He did long ago, many times, in many ways. He spoke to His people through prophets. Alright, but look what He says next. But in these last days... So he's, he's looking at the two different days, right? But in these last days, He has spoken to you, but you know how He speaks to us? By His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Let me tell you something. I am very skeptical of people today that come up to me and say, I got a word from the Lord for you. Now, don't get me wrong. If it lines up with the Word of God, I'm okay with that. You know why? Because that's exactly how God has told me that He speaks to me. And so, yes, He still speaks through people like me, but how does He do it? Now we have the prophets that God used to speak through. Now we have in this Bible the teachings and the life of His Son. And His Son commissioned apostles. And how do we know that we can trust the apostles? Well, in, uh, look with me in... Let me find the Scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Paul, when he's trying to get the Corinthians to understand that they can trust his word, that they can believe what he says to them, look what he says. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs, with wonders, with mighty works. In other words, here's how we know we can trust the Bible. Because the prophets and what they spoke, it came to pass exactly the way that He promised. When God said it was going to be 70 years, guess how many years it was? When God told the Israelites you're going to be in Egyptian bondage for 400 years, and then I'll visit you, guess how many years it was? When God promised them that He was going to raise up a prophet like Moses, uh, uh, but better, He was going to raise up a priest like Aaron, but better, I could go through the whole Old Testament. Here's the point. Everything God ever told in the Old Testament, God fulfilled it in Jesus Christ. Amen. And we saw it happen. And now, how do we know we can trust Jesus? Go back and read John chapter, go back and read the Gospel of John. That's how you know you can believe Jesus. Because Jesus proved who he was over and over again. How do I know I can believe the apostles that their word comes from the Lord? Because they had signs that God gave them that were performed among them with utmost patience, with signs, wonders, and with mighty works. You ever wondered why we don't see the same kind of signs and wonders in the church today the way that we did back then? Now listen, I'm not saying that God don't still heal. How many of you know God still heals? I'm a, I, I tell you, I can give you example, example after that. I'm not saying God still don't speak through people. He does. But what I'm telling you today is that the way that God primarily speaks through people in today's time is through His Son and through His Son's teachings and through us coming from the Word of God and we declare to you, thus says the Lord. Amen. This is the reason why Bible teaching is so important in this church. It's important that you understand that when I'm speaking to you, I'm not just telling you, well, this is what the Lord says, and then you just have to trust me. No, I back it up with what the Word of God says. See, there's a difference in preaching and teaching. Preaching, yes, it is teaching the Word. But the Bible t says that preaching is a proclamation. It is a heralding. It is a running before the king, shouting, Hear ye, hear ye! And it is an inspired word. Whereas teaching is more of, this is what the Bible says. What my job to you this morning is to do, same way the prophet Jeremiah did, to run before you and say, Hear ye, hear ye. This is what the Lord says. He keeps His promises. He keeps His word. Don't you lose faith. Don't you slow down. I don't care if it's been 2,000 years since He made this promise. Does that mean that He's not going to keep it? No. He made the first promise in the Garden of Eden many years before Jesus ever come. But He kept it. He kept His Word. 
And so I want you to understand that God speaks to us through people and through prophets today, but it is different than what it was back then because now we have the written Word of God. And for anybody that would argue with that, let me ask you a question. Since you think that there may be some new revelation that God needs to give us, we already have the revelation of how creation began. So we have the beginning of creation. We already have the revelation of how we fell from that perfect paradise. We already have the revelation of how God is going to redeem us from that sin that we fell in. And then we have the revelation even of the future creation, the new creation and the new heavens and the new earth and what it's going to be like. And we know everything in between about how to be looking forward to that the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 that He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Let me say that one more time. You have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Is there anything left out? Life and godliness are the two things that matter. And so if that is the case, God has revealed to us through the prophets, through His Son, through the apostles, everything that you and I need in order to live this life in a godly manner, in the hope of eternal life. Let me tell you something. You don't need some other prophet standing before you giving you some new revelation that you've never heard before, you've never seen before. What do you need? You need somebody that stands before you that says, Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. And now your job is to when, to when God says something to you, you say, I believe it. I trust it. I trust it with all of my heart. The second thing I want to get with you is that God causes His Word to be fulfilled. I go through that one quickly. But look at um, Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 again. He says here that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus to accomplish His Word, to fulfill His Word. The Lord awakened him. The Lord aroused His Spirit and the Lord directed him to... And again, I believe, I can't prove this to you, but I believe He did it through probably Daniel and the preaching of the Word. I believe Daniel probably came to Cyrus and said, Cyrus, I got something you got to see. 150 years before you were born, Isaiah said this was going to happen to you. Isaiah said, you. He called you by name. I don't know about you, but that says something to me. He calls Cyrus by name 150 years before he's born. And he says in detail how his kingdom is going to expand and how God is going to give him this kingdom and how he's going to send him to build his city back and to build his temple back. And I believe this is exactly how God used the Word of God to stir Cyrus up in this. But also look in verse... Uh, let's keep reading in Ezra 1 verse 2. Thus says Cyrus king of Persia, The Lord God, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. So again, how does Cyrus know that? I believe that Daniel came to him and showed him. Listen, this is 100, 150 years before this happened. God said you were going to have these kingdoms. And... He has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. How did, how did Cyrus know that? Because Isaiah had said it back in Isaiah chapter 45. Go back and read it again. All right. But then he says in verse 3, Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place that he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And then notice what he says in verse 5, because here's the next part you need to see. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God what? God had stirred to go to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Now what am I trying to get to right there? God proclaimed the word through Jeremiah. 
Can God depend on people like you and me to accomplish it? No. No. What is God going to do? He's going to cause His Word to be accomplished. How's God going to do that? He's going to use everybody. He's going to use people that don't know Him, like Cyrus. Go back and read Isaiah 45 again. Even though God did all these things for him, the Bible says he didn't know God. He didn't know Him. And He is going to use people that are His own people. How's He going to do that? He's going to stir their hearts up. And, you know, did you catch who else He's using in this? He's even using the Persian neighbors around Him, the people that work for Cyrus. He says, let them give offerings of silver and gold and beasts and free will offerings to go back and build the house with. Why is that important? Because it's the same thing he did in Exodus chapter 12. Go back and read Exodus chapter 12. When he brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, you know how he prepared them to build the tabernacle and to do all the things and to give sacrifices. Because where are they going to get all the stuff from that God's going to command them to do from Mount Sinai? The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 12 that he put it in the hearts of the Egyptians to give them Uh, Let me find that for you. Oh, you've already found it. Thank you. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them. For they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold, jewelry and for clothing. And then look at this. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what? Whatever they asked. And look what happened. Thus they did what to the Egyptians? (laughs) Are y'all catching this? God is so going to accomplish His Word that He uses everything and everybody to make sure that His Word comes to pass exactly the way that He said it would come to pass. And yet you and me think that our hearts are going to get in the way of God saving us. (laughs) I thank God today. That God keeps His Word. I thank God today that His promise is not based on whether or not I'm perfect. His promise is based on whether or not I believe Him by faith. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's my last point. Number three. Just believing God's Word is not enough. It must be faith. Look again at verse 2 of Ezra. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord... The God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of earth and He has charged me to build Him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah. Sounds like Cyrus is a believer, right? And to some degree, Cyrus does believe that a God, not the God, but Cyrus does believe that a God has actually done what Isaiah prophesied that He would do. And so Cyrus believes God. But I can tell you today that Cyrus did not have faith. How do I know that? We'll go again back to Isaiah chapter 45 again with me. Isaiah 45, look um, at verse 1 through 5 again. We'll read through these. I may be messing Riley up up there asking him to go backwards. If I am, Riley, I apologize. You're doing a great job, brother. All right, it is. Isaiah 45 verse 1, look what he says. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him, that the gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze. I will cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places that you know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though what? Though you do not know me. And go to verse 5. I am the Lord. There is no other Besides me, there is no God. At this point, he's talking to Cyrus. Now Cyrus is not going to read this for 150 years later. But Isaiah's telling it right then. 
And he says, I am the Lord, there is no other besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. Here's the point that I'm trying to make. Cyrus believed God's word enough to say in his proclamation that this Lord, this God has given me everything I have today. But Cyrus did not have faith in who God is. What do I mean by that? The Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God. The Bible says even the demons believe. The demons believe the Word of God. And the demons believe it enough that they tremble. But they do not have faith in God. What is faith? Faith is the full assurance of hope. What does full assurance mean? When you have full assurance in something, what does that mean? You know that you know that you know that you know. Right? Full assurance of hope is what faith is. Where does the hope come from? The hope comes from the Word of God. And when God gives us a Word and we put absolute full assurance in the hope that the Word of God gives us, not just in what God has done for me right now, no, in what the Word of God says about who I am and the, what the Word of God would direct me to do about my sin condition and what God has promised me through His sacrifice. And when I believe that God is going to do what He said He's going to do, why is He going to do it? Because He's God. And He can't lie. And He always keeps His Word. And faith is full. This is the reason why I have so many problems with preachers today that try to tell their members that you can't be sure. I want to tell you today, if you're not sure, you don't have faith. Faith is the full assurance of hope. And it is based on the conviction or the evidence of things unseen. I know that I know that I know, even though I don't have it in my hands right now, but I got so much evidence of who He is and what He's done and how He has kept His Word over and over and over again that my faith is absolutely solid. I want you to understand this morning the whole point that I believe God is trying to tell us in Ezra chapter 1. And I don't think I'm exaggerating it. I really believe this is why Ezra chapter 1 starts out the way that it does. Because I believe that God in the Old Testament wants to show you over and over and over again that when He gives you His Word and He gives you a promise, you can take it to the bank. Amen. And if you will believe Him, He will save you. He told Noah, I'm going to destroy this world with a flood because of sin. And you know what Noah was? A sinner. Noah deserved to go just like the rest of them. But the Bible says that Noah found what in the eyes of the Lord? Grace. You know what grace is? Unmerited love. Undeserved mercy. Noah found grace. You know why Noah found grace? Because he heard the Word of God and God stirred his heart up and he believed the Word of God. And Noah and his family were saved exactly like God said he would do. Noah had faith and he pleased God. God told a lot and his wife and his children that I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But I will save you if you will get yourself out of this place. I will save you. And God stirred the heart of Lot and he stirred the heart of his children. His son-in-laws laughed. His wife turned around and looked. You know why? Because she didn't have faith. She believed enough to actually follow her family out, but she didn't have full assurance of hope in what God had promised. And instead, she looked back. Let me show you one last scripture to show you what I'm talking about. Hebrews chapter 11. I think it's verse 13. Did I give you that one? 
These all died in faith. Noah, Abraham, Sarah, um, Moses, so many. They died in faith. Not having received the things promised. It's interesting. Look what he says. But having seen them and greeted them from afar. You know how they see them? Because God promised them and they saw them. And they greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Look what he says next. For people who speak this way. People who speak what way? They heard the promise of God that we're sinners and this world is hopelessly under His wrath. And they heard the promise of God that those who will trust in Jesus, that He covered it all, that He paid it all, I will save you and give you an inheritance that you, you can't even count. I will give you a, a kingdom that you can't even imagine. And people like that hear the Word of God and they say, God, I believe you. Why do I believe you? Because you keep your Word. You do everything you say you're going to do. I know who you are. And when you have that kind of faith, you speak in a way that says, I'm just a stranger and an exile here. This world is not my home. I don't belong here. I'm not comfortable here anymore because this ain't enough. I'm looking for what He's promised me. And people who speak this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And look at verse 15. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return because Lot's wife did too, right? Now she only had a split second of an opportunity, but she, she looked back. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, I love this part right here. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? Because He has, exactly like He said, He has prepared for them a city. This is faith. This is faith. God has made us a promise. Just like He made promises of old that He's going to come and rescue us out of exile, out of slavery. That He is going to renew His covenant with us. That He's going to restore us back to worship. That He's going to bring us into a kingdom that He is king over and that we get to share in all of His glory in it. And you have two choices today. You can either look back at the examples that said God always keeps His Word and you can say, I believe that He's going to keep it for me too and I know it, I know it, I know it. In spite of who I am. But because of who He is. And when we do that and we follow Him by faith, the Bible says God is not ashamed to be called our God even though we're sinners. He says He's not ashamed to be called our God because He has prepared for us a city. God speaks His Word to you through people today. But it better line up with that Word right there or it ain't from God. God speaks to us through... People like you and I, and we have an obligation to hear it, and we have an obligation and a responsibility to either believe it or not believe it. But I want to promise you this much. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But with faith and faith alone, God will be pleased and God will save you. That is the promise of His Word and He will keep His Word no matter what kind of doubts and insecurities you have in your mind. God will keep His Word. That is a promise. If y'all would, stand this morning. <clears throat> As I said before this service, before the sermon started, God has made so many promises to us. He's promised that in the fire, in the flood, He's going to be with us. And if He said it, guess what? He's going to do it. God promised He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And if He promised it, guess what? He'll do it. God has promised that those who trust in Him, though your sins again be as red as blood, He has promised. 
that He will wash you white as snow through the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if you will but believe it, if you will trust it by faith, full assurance of hope in the promise that God gives, that promise will be yours and He will fulfill it. God keeps His Word. That's the message for today. If I can help you this morning, now is your opportunity to respond for whatever it is that God spoke to your heart. Whatever it is, come now while we sing.